Hello and welcome everybody to another episode of Soccer 101. I'm your host Taylor Rockwell. Joining me today to discuss Bayern Munich is a man who knows everything you need to know about German press box food offerings. It's Manuel Fate. Manuel, thank you for taking the time to speak with me today. Oh, thank you once again for having me on. And um, on that topic, Bayern's press box food is the best in the world. That's what I figured. I assumed they kind of had the most uh, funding to splash when it comes to the press box. Yeah. Oh, it's uh, it's amazing. I mean, uh, I, I saw someone tweet. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to the games right now because of the situation that we're in. Right. Mm-hmm. But I saw someone tweet that um, Bayern Munich is currently encouraging journalists to bring their own broad sites or their own food. I was like, oh, that's a shame. It's not even <laughs> worth going anymore. <laughs> it's not even <laughs> worth going anymore. Yeah, for people who are listening to this months from now, maybe years from now, you never know. We are recording this right after the Bundesliga has returned to action during the COVID-19 coronavirus uh, pandemic. Uh, so we've got the Bundesliga back, which is probably why this topic is front and center in my brain. But uh, press box food rankings aside, where they're number one, when I think of consistent success in world football there are obvious names like Real Madrid Barcelona Juventus but I don't think any team has so consistently dominated its league in my mind at least like Bayern Munich uh, they've won the Bundesliga seven straight times at time of recording uh, they've won it 28 times in total since they first joined in 1964 I believe that means they have won 50% of all Bundesliga titles uh, since they've been uh, in the league that's not bad they've also got a lot of Champions League titles an absurd amount of domestic silverware but I really have never actually paused to think about why they're so good so I've got some ideas, Manuel. I'm hoping you can uh, hear some of those out, but give me some of your own as we try to figure out why Bayern are the Bayern Munich institution that we've come to know. Uh, first of all, I'm very impressed. Because, why is that? Because you said 28 times for the Bundesliga, mm-hmm. which is which is correct. You're absolutely 100 right. Uh, they won the German title 29 times, but mm-hmm. they've actually won. 28 of those 29 titles during the Bundesliga era. Yes. So so that, I'm, very, I'm very impressed you actually <laughs> got that right. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I try. But that is that is like part of it for me and part of why they, like Bayern Munich are such an interesting tale because they have the one title. They're founded in, what, 1900? They have one title in 1901, I think, or something like that. And then they do not win. 1932. There we go. There we go. Yeah. Uh, so the one title before the Bundesliga exists. But then they're also a club that isn't invited to join the Bundesliga when it first yeah. comes to be. Um, and And so I wanted to start there with sort of Bayern Munich joining the Bundesliga. Uh, The Bundesliga, as far as I know, is either the last or the second to last, or Germany were the last or second to last uh, country to sort of professionalize uh, and to get that league going. It's organized in 1963. Manuel, do you know why there was such hesitation or why they were so slow uh, to sort of create this national league? Yeah, it was it had a lot to do with the um, fear of professionalization of football. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the debate was mostly surrounded on that. Um, and then also, I guess it's very similar in the United States or here in, in Canada. Um, the, the the provinces or the lender, as we call them, you would call them states in the U.S., right? They're very mm-hmm. strong. It's a very defederalized country. And so the championships were regionalized. And then the regional champions would meet each other, meet each other in, in the final tournament and to determine the, the, the champion, right, the national champion. And I th- guess because um, after World War II, a lot of it had to do with football being an amateur sport, supposed to be, you know, trying to preserve amateur the amateur principle as long as possible, trying to keep money out as long as possible. Those were all big things. And it, I think it also took a very long time to actually find a consensus of who's going to be in that league Mm -hmm. Uh, you mentioned it Bayern were not in that league Um, the city of Munich was represented by 1860 and at the time both those teams were about the same level they were both big clubs Um, 1860 having won a couple of German cups before um, the the emerging of the league and um, being a very strong side in the 30s and 40s as well. So um, it's very interesting that 1860 was chosen. 1860 was chosen because they won the South German Championship that year. Um, so they basically beat out Bayern because they were they played a better domestic season. So it's even that made it very difficult mm-hmm. to actually pick the the num- numbers of teams because if you you can imagine if you have regional championships and a lot of regional championships. Having to pick, and the original Bundesliga was only 16 teams, it wasn't 18, actually having to pick all the teams that are supposed to be um, put in the first division, because that means a lot of teams are all of a sudden relegated, right? 
it was very difficult. Yeah, it's it's and it's a controversial situation. I think that leads to the expansion to eighteen, where there's maybe mm. so there's, there's some allegations, there's some whisperings of like match fixing, and there's definitely yeah. some tax dodging because you have maximum salaries you can pay and and things like that. So it's a little, it felt a little bit wild west in my reading, but then it also did feel like it was maybe the perfect time in terms of like history in Germany in the Bundesliga uh, for Bayern to come to power because as you mentioned, it's a very defederal, defederalized uh, society or, or state. Yeah. And the state of Bavaria, from what I understand in my reading, was kind of historically maybe not the place where uh, the money was. It was not where the commerce or industry was. It was much more like heavily Catholic, a little bit more like uh, inward. Mm -hmm. And then around this time period is where you do start to get this kind of explosion of wealth. You get jobs Mm -hmm. uh, moving into Bavaria and there's a lot more money going around. So that was the second thing I saw as being critical to Bayern Munich getting the status they did is as professionalism is coming in, Bavaria, where Bayern obviously is, is kind of moving. Moving up in stature is getting a bunch more money and can therefore maybe allow for a bit more spending when it comes to football. Yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, I, I might be biased. I'm Bavarian. Um, <laughs> we are the we are the richest state in in Germany. Um, you know, a lot of other Germans would say we're the Texas of Germany. Um, we have a lot of money. We have a lot of money. We're still pretty conservative. Um, no, other Bavarians are. I'm not, but other Bavarians are. Um, I and. You're quite right. After World War II, the the land of Bayern or Freistaat Bayern, it's not even a land, it's a Freistaat. It's the free state of Bavaria. It's actually, it has actually an other rules and exception clauses because um, the, the Federal Republic of Germany granted Bavaria a bunch of exceptions to join the Federal Republic of Germany after World War II because there was actually talk that Bavaria would join up with Austria and create a South German state. Hmm. So... They meant they were very, you know, the post World War II politics, Bavaria became a powerhouse. It's the the largest state in Germany by um, by area, and it's the second largest by population. And um, a lot of the industry settled in Munich. And more importantly than even industry, a lot of the insurance companies, one of the the world's largest reinsurance company, for example, Münchner Rück, is in Munich. Allianz that sponsors the stadium, mm-hmm. world's largest insurance. In Munich, a bunch of banks, you know, when the country was split up, a lot of banks moved down their capitals like, to their headquarters to Munich. Um, so uh, the city of Munich became very, very rich, um, very quickly rich. And that means, of course, sponsors were there. And we all know that having sponsors right in front of your house door is very <laughs> beneficial <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> if you want to become a rich powerhouse football club. And, and then how much does TV factor into that as well? Because around here is when you start getting, like, I think the first highlights show, uh, soccer highlights show, was it was in uh, was in Germany. I forget, Sportschau or something like that. Uh, so I feel like TV also kind of coming into prominence, you're getting more live broadcasts while you have more money flowing in. It does feel like the kind of stage is set for one team to become, like, the, the national team, the one that's most recognized mm-hmm. around the country. I think they were – I think that is a factor. Mm-hmm. But I think that Bayern were also extremely lucky because – um, you have to remember in the 60s, they shared um, that yeah. top position in Munich with 1860. 1860 wins um, the title in 1966. They lose narrowly out on the title in 1967. 1860 become the first team in German team to reach the final of um, a UEFA Cup composite competition in uh, 1963 against West Ham. They lose that in, at Wembley. Um, you know, and they were the better team at the time. Um, they were sort of the, they were the, the, the lions, you know, the, the, the king of the hill. Mm-hmm. Um, Bayern comes up and they quickly are able to challenge that status because, you know, they had to have a golden generation. They are, Franz Beckenbauer a couple of years before made the decision not to play for 1860, but for Bayern because of an incident at a friendly game. Yeah, he got slapped right. in the face. Is that what <laughs> I read? Does. This is actually a true story. He got what? slapped in the face and he made the decision to not play for 1860. Wow. And a lot of his friends decided to not play for 1860 either. Franz Beckenbauer grew up an 1860 fan. A lot of people don't know this, but he actually has an 1860 membership as well. Wow. So this is, um, you know, but he decided not to play for 1860. He went to Bayern and um, that on its own didn't do it either. Um, yes, they had a golden generation of players, but so did 1860. The thing is, 1860 made a lot of mistakes um, after they did not win that second title. Um, the coach that guided the club for a long time, Merkel, fell out with the board 
and um, there was a lot of money and financial issues. And then in the 70s, 1860 declined. And that kind of opened the door for Bayern to take that top spot in Munich. And if you had the top spot in Munich, then you're also sitting on, you know, the biggest financial income. But even then, in the 70s, Bayern weren't really a financial powerhouse. That did not start until the late 70s, which is um, also kind of interesting. They just, you know, relied on that golden generation of players uh, in the 60s and 70s. And then we're lucky that the right decisions were made. Um, for example, when Oli Hoeneß became the sporting director or what we call in German the manager in 1979, I believe, because of a knee injury. Um, and he stabilized a club that was financially in a huge trouble, but because he had the right contacts with the with the decision makers in Munich. That man is a fascinating man. If it, we'll, mm. we'll pause like the general Bayern Munich, how they're so good conversation, just to say Oli Hoeneß, yeah, takes that position, I think, as you said, in 79, is there until only a couple years ago. Uh, and for the uh, period of time when he's incarcerated for tax evasion and yet still <laughs> elected. He gets reelected once he comes out of jail. How important is he and why is he so important to Bayern? Why is he such a beloved figure that when he does come back and runs uh, again, I believe he was elected unopposed? Yeah, he was. <laughs> uh, but that was it was actually more controversial than mm. you think. There was okay. a lot of people that were not happy about him coming back because – I mean, on the one hand, the argument was he went to jail, he served a sentence, um, and then you rehabilitate it, right? You're like you're supposed mm-hmm. to become part part of the society, and um, so there was some discussions about that. But yeah, you're quite right. I mean, Oli Hoeneß is uh, Oli Hoeneß made Bayern what Bayern are today. Um, to maybe put it in context, Oli Hoeneß is to Bayern what um, Sir Alex Ferguson is to Manchester United. So right. is that is that in terms of like modernizing them? Is that in terms of like pursuing commercial sponsorships, the, the way they yeah. play, the philosophy behind them? Is it just kind of everything goes back to Oli Hoeneß? Absolutely, 100%. Wow. I mean, without Oli Hoeneß, the club would not be where they are today. I mean, Oli Hoeneß, um, and this is this is really fascinating, Oli Hoeneß, when he took over, keep in mind this was at a point where he could have still played. He had to finish his career early. He tried to play. Bayern basically told him, no, your knee is done, and he tried to play for Nuremberg, and... Um, his knee was just so shaky he couldn't play um, football anymore, right? So then he decided, okay, I'm going to go into management. And they basically created this position that we call manager in German, a sporting director. And that was really the creation of that that role in German football in general, that all of a sudden there is a person between the coaching staff and the president you know, and presidents were these almighty figure, figures in German football that manages the team, manages the transfers, brings in the sponsors, um, you know, does the marketing of the team, um, ensures that they merchandise sales and all that kind of stuff. I mean, um, the manager position became so big in these in the 80s and the 90s that there were football games named after the position. There's the manager series from, you know, where you basically play as a manager, the football manager series that you now know love and know that's a lot of those games originate in germany right where you could play as a manager and manage a team you wouldn't even do the coaching you just manage the team um and that's Oli hoeneß was that really was that first manager he basically became the manager of bayern munich and um there's famous stories that he walked into the olympia stadion and he was upset because there was only twenty thousand people watching the team you know a team that's won the european cups three times in a row or he would go into the um, merchandise fan shop and he see items there that no one would buy. And, and then he flew over to America and um, talked to NFL teams and he talked to baseball teams and basketball teams and like, how do you do merchandise? Mm-hmm. And he brought all of that stuff over. He, he modernized the club. You know, that's why when you go to Bayern Munich today, it almost feels like a North American sports franchise is because he, that's what they are you know he went over to the u.s and he learned and that's why also why bayern became one of the first teams in germany to or in the world even to internationalize the way they did um and that's all his doing um you know he's done a phenomenal job that way and a visionary that way and he was able to maintain that for a very very long time 
You mentioned the uh, Olympia study on there. Uh, let, let's focus in on that for a moment because that also feels like a thing that is probably fairly important in understanding the kind of reach of Bayern and the kind of like uh, amount of space they've carved off in the German market. Uh, Munich obviously gets the right to host the World Cup in 19, or excuse me, the Olympics in 1972, hence the Olympic yeah, Stadium. The Olympics, there we go. Yeah. Um, how much of an advantage do you think that sort of incredibly modern new ground, uh, how much does it give Bayern in terms of being this kind of global brand, but also allowing them to kind of increase? their revenue quite a bit yeah absolutely i mean the stadiums are always important right and um basically being gifted a seventy-two thousand seat stadium <laughs> is is a nice thing it's not bad, it's not, bad. <laughs> it's not bad um i mean we laugh today about the olympia stadium because it's an incredibly horrible place to watch football um it's um you know Wait, we why why football. is it so horrible because it's the very press boxes don't have good food. Is that what it is? It's it's very far away from the field. Oh, okay. And in a lot of parts of the stands, because it has a running track. I mean, uh, as a kid growing up, I would go to many many games there, and um, I'd be in the standing area, and you know, you couldn't see the other end of the goal field, like <laughs> the standing area behind the goal. <laughs> you could sort of guess who scored. <laughs> That's what that was about it. But That's the it, dream it, right there. Yeah, I yeah. mean, on the main and the main stands, it was fine. But you know, most of us fans, we congregate in the standing areas, and it it was it was not a fun viewing experience. I, I tell you that much. I mean, when you compare it to the Allianz Arena where they are today, where I think on average you're no further than five meters away from the field, no matter where you sit in the stadium at the Allianz. Wow, uh, I, you did not have that experience at the Olympia Stadium because it has these wide sweeping stands right it's very grand it's a beautiful stadium it's actually a beautiful facility but it's just not built well yeah. for soccer and um so these these stands are kind of wide sweeping out so the further you are up the further you're also away from the field and in the winter time oh and tyler i have stories for you because munich gets cold in the winter right it gets it gets freezing cold mm-hmm. and, and it only has the one roof but even <laughs> I, I remember having these like main tickets for i think it was a, a european cup game um, and it was snowing in sideways, and the snow would just not stop. But the, the roof, it was, it was a joke. <laughs> it would not stop anything <laughs> that day. So like, it, it's a far it's cry. Like a shock of defense, it won't stop anything. Hey, yeah, it would topical. stop anything. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So you know, it was a far cry. It's for today, it's a far cry from a modern stadium. But back in the day, it was very important because all of a sudden you you could put seventy two thousand bodies into a into the stadium, right? And back then. Um, you know, I, I said the other day on a, on a podcast or I wrote in an article, you know, nowadays attendance figures means nothing. You know, 14 percent of the income of the average Bundesliga side comes from attendance. It's nothing. Mm-hmm. That's why they're playing behind closed doors right now. Right. Because they can. Have, it's it's better for them to get that television money, the merchandise and all that other stuff, because that makes up 86 percent of the income. That wasn't the case back then. You know, it actually mattered to have bombs on the seat. Um, so having 72,000 seats was a big advantage for them. Hey, everybody. This is Taylor jumping in for one quick second. Much more still to come from my conversation with Manuel Fates of Transfer Marked. No E at the end, just Transfer Marked, as well as the Football Grad Network, the Gig and Pressing podcast. Uh, but before we get back to him, I wanted to let you know that today's episode of Soccer 101 is brought to you by Hims, a new wellness brand for men. 40% of men uh, by age 40 struggle from not being able to get and maintain an erection. That's something that Hims would like you to know. Uh, why do guys turn to weird solutions or do nothing? The, the doing nothing, I think is like slightly more understandable but not as defensible because at least if you're taking like weird supplements and gas station counter supplements like at least you're trying to take action but that's bad action take smart action that's backed by science uh hymns connects you with real licensed doctors and fda approved pharmaceutical products to treat ed uh they offer well-known generic equivalents to name brand prescriptions uh best of all basically you answer some questions about your medical history you chat with a doctor for a confidential review if you are approved the products will be shipped directly to your door so basically you can handle it discreetly and quickly and without having to resort to gas station counter supplements that are never a good idea so if you'd like to you can try hymns today by starting out with a free online visit go to forhims.com slash total soccer ed that's f-o-r-h-i-m-s dot com slash total soccer ed forhims.com slash total soccer ed prescription products are subject to doctor approval and require an online consultation with a physician who will determine if a prescription is appropriate you can see the website for full details 
details and safety information. This could cost hundreds if you went in person to the doctor's office or to a pharmacy, but nobody wants to do that. So remember, instead, go to 4 slash Total Soccer ED. Thank you very much to Hims for sponsoring today's episode. Now back to Manuel. So Bayern have the money coming in. They've got the 72,000 uh, people in attendance, ideally. Uh, many of those people are there to watch Franz Beckenbauer, who you mentioned previously. He is one who, like, in my notes, in terms of important uh, points in Bayern history, Franz Beckenbauer might be, like, the biggest one in my mind because mm. he's this figure who, in a lot of ways, sort of modernizes the game, creates this position. If you want to be generous, you can make the argument that there's, like, 400 other types of liberos. He <laughs> creates this one that's very unique. But it does sort of dominate German soccer, in my understanding, that it, it kind of continues until like the early 2000s when suddenly Germany realizes, yeah, we need to change things up. Maybe mm-hmm. basing our entire approach on something that started in the 60s is not the best idea. But w- what is it about Beckenbauer, aside from some of the things I've already mentioned, that like makes him such this pivotal figure, such an important figure uh, to Bayern Munich and to German soccer in general? Yeah, it's almost like a Jesus-like figure, isn't he? Like we even call him the Lichtgestalt, Gestalt. so the, the shining example, oh, wow. the shining figure. Um, Kaiser is another one. That you yeah. know, he's, he's um, I mean, he was someone who, no matter what he did, he no matter what he touched, turned into gold. He was the first player to win the World Cup and then win it as a coach as well, right? Is that's it's a remarkable story. And then he brought the World Cup to Germany in 2006. And I mean, that's that's sort of something that they're now kind of trying to destroy his legend a little bit in Germany because of the allegations, them, uh, some of which now turned out he wasn't involved in, um, of, of Germany paying to get that tournament. I mean, come on, everyone pays for that tournament, to be honest here, but um, <laughs> it's an entirely different story. I don't know what you mean. I think the United States, Canada, and Mexico all just won it cleanly, and there's nothing to look into, and let's probably not take that away. Everybody just calm down, and let's focus on Beckenbauer. Yeah, let's focus on Beckenbauer, because if we <laughs> open that can of worms, I think we'll be here tomorrow. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, he's he's... If, if you haven't seen tape of him playing, I, I think you really should because it's a very, very elegant player. Um, you know, Sinedine Sedan kind of reminds me a little bit of mm-hmm. Franz Beckenbauer because we think of the Libero as a defensive player nowadays, right? Um, it's not someone we have in mind as a, as a creative uh, person, but yeah. in actual fact, the Libero was supposed to be a playmaker with playing, sitting very deep between the defensive line and midfield. It's more of you know, we talk about creative aids nowadays. Let's be honest here. They're really just liberals, um, you know, which is basically terming positions that have existed for a long time. We just give them new fancy names. It's um, but that's he was a very creative player and he was one of the few players that could actually play a pass over 40, 50 meters and it would actually reach a target. I mean, we laugh about that now because nowadays everyone can play that pass. But back then, that was a huge skill. And the ability to pick our players and to basically take command of a game and to win a game on its own is something that you know not many players could do. And there's a reason why when we when we name the world's best players, um, you know, before Lionel Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo came along, it's always Pele, Beckenbauer, Krauf, Maradona. You know, those are the names that right away come to mind. Um, and there's a reason for that, and it's because basically dropped into this Bayern side and he he was their leader for a very very long time and he you know with him on the field they they were able to have a very creative figure and player that could just command games but you know there's so much attention paid on Franz Beckenbauer that we almost forget that there was a bunch of other players on that team that also were yeah. very very good <laughs> And, you mentioned that uh, golden generation. Who are, who are the names that you think are, are most important when it comes to the the success and long term stability of Bayern Munich? Well, so many in Franz Beckenbauer would say this. The first thing um, is Gerd Müller, and you know Gerd Müller. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think he's got 365 goals in 363 Bundesliga games. I feel like you know that I can't correct you, but I'll agree That's, with you that yes, yeah. that sounds right. I think it's, six, it's 365 because I remember when he turned, I think even he turned 65, they did uh, a thing in Germany where they showed a goal every day. And because it was as many goals scored and goal, then we have days in the year. So they showed a goal every day. Um, 
that was on one of the public TV stations. But yeah, he, I mean, he scored wow. a lot of goals and he scored a lot of goals in the European Cup games. He scored a lot of goals for Germany, 68 and 65. He was the top scorer until Miroslav Klose got the same amount of goals in twice the games, right? Um, so he, he was a very important player because in the end of the day, Bayern Munich, if they had a really bad game, um, he would just pop out of nowhere and score. And basically save them and um you know this i think that is something if get muller was around today I, I, he would be probably invaluable you couldn't mm. buy a player like that on the market today because you w- how many players do you know that have scored you know basically a goal a game right and, and, and I, I can Christian think of one he plays for dortmund <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay Holland, but let's see if he can do that over yeah. an entire career right yeah that's fair uh, he's a good path towards it now he, he probably could be one of those players to be quite fair but yeah i mean we're basically talking Lionel messi and ronaldo yeah. at this stage right and uh, that's how good he was so you already have two on that team out of that level and so then uh, like like in terms of oh, sorry continue with the golden generation then we'll move to to more modern times well, then you have Sepp Meyer in goal, yeah. um, one of the first modern goalkeepers um, ever to play. You know, um, <laughs> it's actually a funny anecdote. There's a game that Bayern played, and the, you can find the clip online, I'm sure. Bayern were so dominant in that game that he would start uh, trying to catch ducks on the side of the field um, <laughs> doing actual gameplay. Yeah, you can look this up. It's on YouTube. <laughs> Uh, All right. It's a, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal player uh, at this time. And then, I mean, Oli Hoeneß was tied part of this team. Karl-Heinz Rummenigge later as well. Um, you know, there were so many names on that team. And they were consistently able to add players to this team um, that made them better. So, yeah, it's that Jordan generation. Um, and I think... That is remarkable in itself, but I think what's remarkable is that they were able to replicate that golden generation several times, and like you know, rebuild t- teams because that's where a lot of teams fall, right? They're not yeah. able to maintain that over many, many years, and I think that's always very interesting. And how, how in your mind, do you think they're able to do that? Because that is the other thing that stood out to me is with Bayern. Yes, in, in modern history, you have them spending some money. Certainly, you have them kind of utilizing the free transfer uh, like process. Uh, we can talk about that too. But generally speaking, they seem very adept at bringing through young talent that is either th- from their academy from a very early age of like nine or ten, or players that they signed at maybe like fourteen, fifteen, sixteen who then have some time in the academy and then come through but either way they tend to have a lot of success when it comes to developing youth why do you think that is how have they institutionalized that because as far as i know they don't have something like uh la masia that uh or la masia that uh barcelona have so i'm assuming they have something else that kind of makes them so adept at this sort of developmental ability now, some of it is luck um, okay. <laughs> i think i think that barcelona were also just lucky uh, you know you look at their the what's going on at barcelona right now i think the 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 illusion that they would just keep doing this is is a little bit off. Um, I think the only club that has been consistently doing this is is Ajax. You know, yeah. This is this is really a. I mean, they have an academy that has consistently produced over forty years very good players. Bayern have done that to a certain extent as well, but they haven't just you know they 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 haven't had an academy. They have one now, um, the Bayern Campus they call it. Um, which is an, a top-notch facility, and they're spending a ton of money um, trying to basically develop youth talent, so that they because they know that even though they are cash rich, they're the financially the richest club on on the planet, right? In terms of how much money they have in the bank, but they don't have that ability to just re- regenerate money that they're spending because everything that they're spending they have to generate themselves. They're not they don't have an investor. There's no owner. You know, they are uh, basically the anything that's spent, they have to make first. So they saying, OK, well, we should build an academy and try to develop a lot of the talent ourselves, because the most expensive signing they ever made was Lucas Hernandez for 18, 80 million euros. And that was a decision that took them a year to make because they didn't want to spend that much money because, you know, 80 million euros is a lot of money for this club. So their thinking is um, to spend a lot of money on the academy is actually better because you can get these younger players um, like a Joshua Zirkse, for example, who has made headlines this year and develop them. So this is this is but this is a new development. Um, this is not something that they have done forever. Um, they have, however, have developed their own players. You know, you think about Bastian Schweinsteiger, Philipp Lahm, 
um, David Alaba, uh, Thomas Müller. Those are all players that have come through the academy and they, that they were developed at the Sebener Straße and they were spotted in the in the greater Munich area. And they have done a very, very good job in that regard, especially when you consider that just down the road from where they are, 1860, also have a very good academy. Um, despite them being in the lower divisions, they produce a y- lot of y- good young players. So um, it's interesting that those two clubs are actually competing in that level and both of them producing quite a lot of talent. And um, I think a lot of it was luck to find those right players. And I think then this is probably something that we're going to talk about next, right, Tyler, is their ability to just get players on the very cheap. Yeah, let, let's talk about that. I do also want to talk about luck because I have a question mm. specifically about luck. But first, let's talk about their ability to get players. And I want to start from a perspective of with the players they develop and with the players that they sign, we, we've we've already established that they didn't really have the academy until recently. But uh, so, so I'm, I'm still like sticking with Barcelona comparisons here. Do they have that sort of similar similar operational philosophy to what uh, Barca get in the like early '90s when Cruyff comes in? Is there a sort of Bayern philosophy that's baked into their academy players, to the coaches they're looking for, mm. to the style they want to play? Yeah, the, the Mir San Mir. Um, Sorry, what was that? that? Was the Mir San Mir. The Mir San Mir. We okay. are who we are. Oh, okay. Uh, and it is a little bit of arrogance. Um, but I think that in their mind, arrogance means winning. Mm-hmm. And it's hard to argue with them because they win a lot. <laughs> you know, not just in the Bundesliga, but in Europe as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, you think if you take the Champions League as and you turn it into a league table, I think they would be in the top three easily, right? Yeah, because they're always, so. they're always in at least in the semifinals. I had a statistic somewhere. I think they were just behind um, Real Madrid and Barcelona when it comes to all-time wins and... Um, you know, they're very, very, very consistent um, on a very high level. So I think that is just basically their big motto is just to win. And sometimes it's to win at any cost. And that's something that they've been criticized in Germany and in Europe, that they will do anything it takes to win games, sort of like Real Madrid a little bit, right? Um, so it, it, that's a little bit of their philosophy. And they're trying to get that ingrained more into the club and the youth players and they've been trying to develop a bit more of a playing philosophy as well that they want to have the ball at all times and that's something that in in many ways really started under Louis van Gaal Hmm. um, when they brought him in in the 2009 I believe it was Um, he was in charge for just two years and he caused a whole bunch of great innovation, but a whole bunch of problems as well, because he's Louis van Gaal. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I think Louis van Gaal is one of the best coaches on the planet that ever existed. I think he's a, he's a fantastic coach. Tactically, he is incredible. Um, he is a complicated human being. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> a very complicated human being. I mean, in, in Dutch, like in German, they have an informal and a formal to address um, each other and his daughters have to address him formally so this is the kind of person he is so wow. incredible complicated person right <laughs> but he's incredibly um, his tactical level is just incredible I, I mean Tyler do you remember that 1994-1995 Ajax side I, I do we just profiled them Daryl and I did yeah. they are pretty amazing to watch especially that yeah. one the one goal that everybody's seen the counter attacking goal where everybody knows exactly how to play it and exactly how many touches they have uh, it's pretty phenomenal. I was actually living in Amsterdam when Louis van Gaal was the head coach of Bayern. And it was a really interesting experience. Louis van Gaal was in the news a lot. So we're Bayern in the Netherlands. And it was really interesting to get a Dutch perspective on A, my home city, <laughs> and the biggest club in my home city. Because, you know, they were talking about mm-hmm. a lot. And I was playing football in the Netherlands at the time, too. So it was really interesting to chat to people about this and to just get a perspective of how he thinks. And I mean, they all regarded him quite highly, but even in the Netherlands, they thought he was kind of weird. And uh, he spent a lot of time going back to Amsterdam because he wrote a book at the time. I think it was a thousand word Bible kind of thing, you know, like letter bound and called it his like philosophy. And uh, it's it was quite amazing. I should maybe get it one day and um, signature or something. But, um, you know, he, in, he brought in this this idea that if we are Bayern, we always have to have the ball because we're the most dominant team in, 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 in Germany and we have to play possession football. Um, and that kind of stuck with this latest golden generation. You know, this whole 
we always have to have the ball and the possession. Everyone thinks, okay, that started with Pep Guardiola. It, it didn't really. It started with Louis van Gaal. And Louis van Gaal then handed it over to um, Jupp Heynckes, mm-hmm. right? Um, and then Jupp Heynckes handed it over to Pep Guardiola. Then we had this experiment with... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, Niko Kovac. <laughs> well, Car- Carlo's in there too, not Carlo disciplining at all too. and making everybody Carlo, happy and then Carlo, sad. Carlo and Nico wanted to turn it all away and play counter football, uh, especially in the Champions League, because they had this odd idea that maybe they have to beat Real Madrid um, playing counter football, not understanding that, you know, like 90% of the time, Bayern plays an opponent that is better, is, is worse than them. Mm-hmm. And that's no matter where they're playing, which competition they play, it doesn't matter. 90% of the time, Bayern Munich are the better side, right? And that's just how it is. So playing counter football, it, it just didn't work. I mean, we, we, we both were on location when Nico Kovac's counter football mm-hmm. finally completely fell apart. Yeah, it did. Um, <laughs> so it's it just, they're a team that have to have the ball. And Hansi Flick understands that. And it's also, um, I think philosophy-wise, it's also a team where the coach is not supposed to be the most dominant person at the club. And I think that's ultimately why Louis van Gaal didn't work out and why Pep Guardiola, even though he was quite successful, uh, maybe moved on, although the players loved him. But it's because the players at Bayern are always more important than um, the coach. Even though it's interesting, they say that the the club is more important than the players. That's why they have actually the club name on top and the player name on the bottom on the shirts. But in actual fact, it is the players that run the club. And that's always been the case. Whether you, it was it Franz Beckenbauer's era or whether it is now. Back then it was Franz Beckenbauer, now it's Thomas Müller. But it's that's, I think, the biggest part of Bayern to, to be successful is as a coach to let the players, give the players the illusion that they're the ones deciding the way they play football. So you, you mentioned that the kind of like the operational philosophy for a long time was, I'm not going to try the German, but we are what we are, which is basically like winning is most important. That's what we want to do is win. Is it sort of fair to say that like it's basically win at all costs, uh, regardless how you play until Louis van Gaal comes along, and then it's more so win at all costs, but like try to do it in a pretty way? Yeah. And I think that's also why maybe Pep was more successful than Louis. Because Pep is like, we want to win at all costs and play pretty football. And Pep is the kind of coach that wants to win a game 10 nil, right? That's a perfect philosophy for Bayern. And then with the idea that like the players have more of the power, that it's a club about the players, is that a selling point? Like, Is that a known thing that if you're considering moving to Bayern, is there an awareness that you will be given a bit more freedom or be given a bit more kind of leadership responsibility? Or is that maybe less of an important aspect these days? No, Bayern is a shark tank. Um, <laughs> it's, 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 All right. <laughs> if you walk into that dressing room, you I think it's quite hard, difficult. Um, I mean, just just look what Manuel Neuer is doing to Nübel right now, and he's not even there yet. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's I think it's quite brutal. Uh, I think as a the hierarchy is very much established. Uh, you just you, T- Thomas Müller fired two coaches. I mean, <laughs> that's before his tier. Yeah, I mean, obviously he didn't go and fire them, but you know that there is certain personalities uh, in that dressing room. And that's really interesting. If you cross them, and that's always been like that at Bayern. If it wasn't Thomas Müller, it was someone else. No, before, it's, it's, it was, it was Matthäus, and before it was Beckenbauer. Exactly. You know? It's funny you mentioned that. Right? When, I, was, when I was reading the the manager, when I think. Early in Beckenbauer's career was uh, Zlatko Kaczkowski. Yeah. Yeah. And and he basically is like, yeah, we're not going to win with you. You kind of have very idealistic ideas, but maybe you aren't pragmatic enough to win in Europe. And then a new coach comes in. I see the similarities there of the the main figure deciding, yeah, maybe you're not going to work out so well for this club. And then they don't. Oh, 100%. The club is run by the players. And that's why Hansi Flick is such a great coach for them, because Hansi Flick is a fantastic tactician. But how often do you see Hansi Flick... Um, front and center at the club you know he does his press conferences yeah. he does his work on the training ground which he does excellently um, but he's not the star and neither was Heinkes really no you know, <laughs> Heinkes is never a star but he was an amazing coach you know, Louis Van Gaal may have been a star but yeah, not yeah that, was a, that was a big problem it worked about two years same with Kovac I mean Kovac um, tried to bring in a new philosophy and you know um, 
we all remember Thomas Müller's wife's um, mm -hmm. Instagram post, I think it was, you know, uh, 65 minutes until he finally gets the proper idea when he brought on Thomas Müller. <laughs> Uh, that was the beginning of the end <laughs> for Carlos Angelotti the beginning of the end was when uh, Thomas Müller kind of uh, spread the rumor that he was going to leave um, I remember being on our gegenpressing podcast and saying to Chris at the time well, Chris Williams who was also on the show the Christmas tree is on fire when Thomas Müller the heads like puts out statements like that and that yeah. was in October yeah you know? <laughs> so, I remember yeah. being hopeful as a Man United fan thinking maybe there was a chance but then no but then, no, it wasn't meant to be. It was not meant to be. Uh, how have they been so good recently, though, with their talent acquisition? The biggest ones would be the free transfers that uh, we, we've kind of come to expect from Bayern Munich. Uh, Lewandowski, Neuer, Goretzka, Sebastian Rudi. Uh, uh, who is Schalke's goalkeeper that they've already done that with? Nubel. That's the one. You already mentioned him. Yeah. Yeah, so how have they sort of become so successful in that? Is it just that Bayern have that reputation so people will happily uh, hold out signing new contracts to be able to move to Bayern? I think when I always say this, it's really horrible for the rest of the Bundesliga that one of the three biggest clubs in the world is in that league. Because, um, you know, if they were in England, they would do exactly the same just to the, all the other Premier League sides mm -hmm. because they're just so big. Um, you know, as a club, they are on the same level than Juventus, Real Madrid and Barcelona, which means they can bully anyone into getting the player, right? It's just unfortunate that the they happen to be in the Bundesliga and no one has come, yet come close to touching that position. Although I think Dortmund is getting there. I think they are going to eventually um, be able to touch Bayern. And I mean, they're doing the same to poor Leverkusen, right? They're signing everyone's, mm -hmm. uh, everyone else's players on free contracts. So they're learning quickly that that's how a business is done. But I think that is really, um, as a model, they're just very big you are guaranteed titles and including the Champions League. There's not many clubs out there that can guarantee you that you are going to play for a Champions League title if you are at that club, right? That's a big pull. Um, for Germans, you don't have to go abroad. And we're talking about a country that has won the World Cup four times. So we're talking about one of the best footballing countries in the world. So if you are the top dog in a country that produces a lot of good players, you're laughing, right? Um, and that's that's just... A big thing for them and i think another really big aspect is they're just willing to wait mm -hmm. because robert Lewandowski, they were willing to wait for two years frank ribery yeah um they wanted to sign frank ribery in 2006 the price was too high so they just waited a year leroy sané they're waiting a year now they're probably going to get him for 40 50 million euros instead of 125 Right. And it, how do they do that legally? How do they do that without tapping up, without kind of talking to the player and saying, like, hey, maybe don't sign that new contract. We'll definitely give you one later on. I, I think it was on The Athletic that I read an article that everyone taps everyone up. Oh, okay. so. That makes more sense. <laughs> um, you know, I want to give a plug to that outlet because I know you guys are on there. So, yeah, I yeah, think I read that on buddy. The Athletic. And I, I, I mean, you know, I work for a company that works mm -hmm. quite closely with agents, so I can't really confirm that. But <laughs> I think we all know that's happening. All right. Well, let's then, be honest here. <laughs> then then let's, let's move away from a thing that could get you into trouble and into a, a, another interesting point you made. You mentioned that like if they were in the Premier League, you feel like they would be able to do the same thing because they have that financial might. But the Premier League does have the ability to have a lot more financial might come in, as Newcastle are finding out, as Man City and Chelsea have uh, mm -hmm. previously found out. You can have that sort of influx of money because it's easier to have that private owner who then can uh, splash all they want or the private investment fund, if you want to go that route. Whereas Germany obviously do not with some exceptions that was the other big one for me was the 50 yeah. plus one rule in terms of not just like helping kind of establish Bayern but then almost making it difficult for some teams to compete like not not like like intentionally or anything like that but if you can't have club like organizations come in and, and buy a club just like flood them with money and make things happen yeah. Leipzig being the exception then it's maybe going to be a little bit of a slower process for teams to try to catch up to the juggernaut that is Bayern Munich is that fair to say then that 50 plus one probably factors into this conversation a little bit as well I think it does but interestingly enough Bayern Munich are actually kind of against 50 plus one and they are actually Karl-Heinz Rummenigge in particular has spoken about that a few times that he wouldn't mind the Bundesliga abolishing that rule they don't want to abolish it for themselves because obviously they're quite happy that um, they don't have an owner. But um, I think that they would actually relish a Manchester City kind of type of scenario where someone else would come in and try to kick them off, um, you know, the top position in the league. 
Uh, I, I guess that's why they also kind of, you know, help. They help out teams. I mean, they helped out Borussia Dortmund when they were on on the ground and um, gave them money. I, I think also that's why Bayern Munich are quite happy about RB Leipzig being in the league because it gives them competition. Right. They, they're quite aware that they need that. Um, they need other big teams like themselves in that league. So I think that's a fair point. The Premier League has a lot of artificial money in it. Um, I do think the Premier League is a bit of a bubble. And we're going to probably see that now. Again, if you listen to this maybe four or five years from now, and he's like, oh, yeah, maybe he was right. <laughs> yeah. Maybe he was completely wrong. Um, but I think COVID-19 is going to burst the Premier League bubble because they spend more than they earn, right? Um, and German teams also spend too much money, but they spend on average only about 86% of their income, right? So um, as horrible as the situation was for the Bundesliga in its entirety, they are probably in a much better financial situation, which is actually horrifying because 13 teams were on the brink of bankruptcy mm-hmm. in the Bundesliga. I don't even want to know how what the situation is like in Italy, Spain, or in England. If the Bundesliga was that poor, then you know, you know it was bad. But I think they would personally like it um, to have that challenge. And I think that their business model and the way they operate would also be enormously successful in the Premier League. You know, that ability to just wait for the right player and to sign a player cheaper. And you see it. I mean, look at what the club has done at Liverpool. That that's business sense, that's that comes from Germany. And hmm. he has waited on transfers, um, sat out on transfers, or not done transfers at all because they didn't make financial sense. And he's doing a fantastic job of that. Who are you talking about? Jurgen Klopp. Oh yeah, Klopp. Yeah, because like, yeah, that's what he does with Naby Keita, right? Like he signs him yeah. and then waits a year before he can play him. There's a little bit of patience with Virgil Van Dijk, some patience, and then you end up spending that money. But yeah, that makes sense. So you've got to have that sort of patience, and then as you mentioned a couple times, you've got to have the luck. This was not a thing I was aware of until I started reading more about Bayern. What is Bayern Doozle? <laughs> uh, what was it? Fergie time in the UK? Yep, it's the same thing. So it's basically the idea. It comes from the idea that, that I read. I think this was from uh, from Club Soccer 101. It's yeah. the idea that it's like like they almost have some sort of divine presence, a higher power that allows them to score late goals that are very yeah. important. Yeah, but I do think that better teams tend to yeah. you know get get their way. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think that's. I I personally don't believe much in luck, uh, but I do think that hard work leads to proper results. And it's no coincidence that the best teams in the world somehow still get a winner late, right? Because they just don't stop. Mm-hmm. It's that mentality yeah. that you can still win a game, and they have that. That's why you see Thomas Müller pop up in the 90th minute to score a winner against Juventus Turin, right? That's why you have those legendary games between Bayern Munich and Real Madrid, because they both have that mindset. And it's scary to see two teams that have that mindset play against each other. And that's why they win more than other teams. Um, and sometimes they're not lucky. I mean, Manchester United yep. hurt them brutally. And I, I think that is something that they still is very deep in that club's mindset as well, that no game ends until mm-hmm. it actually ends. <laughs> um, and they had that was a lesson that they did not learn until 1998. Um, so, yeah, it's Bayern. Sorry, it was 1999, I believe, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, 1999. Um, but yeah, Bayern Dusel is certainly a thing, but it's the same as, as Fergie time. You know, <laughs> um, it's the same idea. So we've talked about a lot of different concepts uh, that I thought were very important. Are there any that we haven't mentioned that you think are maybe fundamental to understanding how Bayern have had this sort of prolonged success? Or if we've covered them all, what are maybe the biggest ones you think that have sort of led Bayern to be the juggernaut that they are today? I think it's really... That ability to, and I always admired that about them quite a bit. And I see it now, some other teams are trying to replicate it. Um, Ajax comes to mind, for example, is that continuity at the very top. The fact that some of that golden generation then went into the leadership of the club, like Oli Hoen is becoming the sporting director, right? Franz Beckenbauer becoming president. Um, and to sort of preserve that that a sense of success and take it to the boardroom. And the fact that the club is run by former players and not management types is quite fascinating in itself because you you have people making decisions, not always the right ones and sometimes cocky ones and sometimes silly ones, but always with the mind of winning games on the field, right? And I think that is something that is, um, that's made the club 
really successful is that successful players then moved into important management positions. And I think we're now getting to a point where it's going to be fascinating to watch whether that golden generation from the 70s, you know, the Romanege and Hoeneß, who are now handing off their positions to successors, whether that can be preserved. You know, Oliver Kahn is coming in to um, become the new head of the board to replace Rummenigge. Um, Hasan Salihamidzic, um, a controversial sporting director in my opinion, but you know also someone who's played under Hoeneß. He's now hand-given the position of the sporting director. And it's going to be interesting to see whether these people that are uh, basically played under Hoeneß and also were part of golden generations themselves, Khan and Salihamidzic won a lot of titles. Khan, of course, was... Um, both experienced Manchester and then also won the Champions League a couple of years later, right? And I think it's going to be really interesting whether they can then hand that off to them and whether they can preserve that and be able to hand it off sort of to the next golden generation, which would be the Schweinsteigers and the Lams, right? And if that, if you can keep going with that forever, right? That is yeah. going to be a very, very interesting thing to watch because you're right they dominated the Bundesliga for a long time but in a sense it's been the same generation in charge from the 60s to now that's, that's really fascinating I hadn't thought about that yeah I mean you saw what happened with Manchester United after yeah. Ferguson left right yeah. and Liverpool had the same experience mm -hmm. um, there was a bunch of people that the Dalkish area right mm -hmm. that um, were in charge and um, they they had a sort of a generation that sort of managed to preserve it. And then all of a sudden it was lost. The spark was gone. And it's been many, many years without a title. Um, with COVID, and then COVID-19 comes along, which is mm -hmm. shocking for them, I guess. But it's, it's, going to be, it's going to be hard to make that next step. And it's going to be really interesting to see whether Borussia Dortmund say, hmm, <laughs> you know, maybe the Khans and the Salih Hamidzic of this world aren't as clever as we are. Or maybe Le Leipzig, maybe that has come, maybe they... Minzlav and Gröschke and Nagelsmann now in charge of that club, they say, okay, well, we can be just as clever or maybe smarter or more innovative. And I think that's going to be a really interesting transition from where they are now at the very top. And they have been at the very top for a long time and whether they can preserve that. It's going to be fascinating to watch. Final question for you when it comes to Bayern Munich. Uh, I texted you about Thomas Muller and what you think he does post-playing career, specifically about managing. If mm. you had to guess what he ends up doing, would you expect him to be like a front office like CEO of Bayern? Would you expect him to be a coach? Or would you expect him to not be involved at all and sort of disappear to horse racing and all that good stuff? Yeah, it's. I mean, he would be. he would be definitely a person that... You would think he could he could be one of those mm -hmm. ambassadors of the club, right? Um, I mean, he does think a lot about football. Um, he does speak quite a bit about football as well, right? And he has he has that ability. I think people make a little bit fun of him because he's a bit cocky, um, especially to English speakers, which is fair enough. You know, his wife is very into horses, and he, he's apparently too, and he likes to make shoot videos and have fun with them. But mm -hmm. I think he understands the game quite well. And it's going to be interesting to see whether he's going to be one of those personalities that could come forward and really do something post-career. But I actually think that the one person I would look out for the most is Bastian Schweinsteiger. Mm -hmm. I think that he's going to take a step back now. He's a very smart man, um, very intelligent man, and he's made some really good decisions in his career. And always acted very classy. I mean, when he more or less left off off by Mourinho, he never complained. Um, he came over to the United States and did the same things than Beckenbauer did. You know, he was a real ambassador of, of the game. And um, then stepped down, I think, at the right time. And I think we could see, I could see him disappear for a little bit and then really come back in a big leadership role, similar to Oliver Kahn, who's who I also really, who I really think is highly qualified. And maybe Thomas Müller is another one. Um, but it's going to be interesting to see because I think we still get a few more years out of Thomas Müller. And I think right now he's actually been very good again. Yep. 
Uh, yeah, um, and so you should, uh, if you are a neutral, you should keep watching Bayern to get to see Thomas Muller. You'll get to see him in Der yeah. Klassiker uh, next week, uh, if you're listening to this before that happens. If you're listening to it after, we are recording, as I said, in the middle of the uh, coronavirus pandemic that is ongoing, but the Bundesliga is back. Manuel, you have mentioned your podcast a couple times. Can you tell people who are unfamiliar with it a little bit about what you all do, what you all talk about? Yeah, that's the this gig pressing podcast. We mm-hmm. do it once a week. We were on a hiatus during COVID-19. We didn't think we should be talking about the Bundesliga if there's no actual Bundesliga. And I think people were busy with other things. Mm-hmm. Um, but when the announcement was made that it's coming back, we did a special on that. Then we did a preview on match day 26. And then today, um, by the time of recording, yeah. May 18th, the, the Monday of the, the after the Monday game, um, we recorded our regular once a week post match day show and we actually had Derek Ray on who's the voice of the oh, Bundesliga nice. yeah. yeah he's a very good friend of ours he he comes on quite regularly we actually managed to get quite a lot of regulars on there the Kevin Hatchards the Derek Ray Archie Root, um, you're in touch. you know you're in touch yeah for example um, thinking of a few Jonathan Harding has been on we had Rafa Honigstein on at one point you know, we all know each other in the German yeah. game, and it's 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 a nice podcast. It's, it's it's a show that we've been doing for a long time. We're in episode 158. You know, and, um, all of us we go to games as reporters, so we have. I like to think that we have somewhat of an insight. I, I, you definitely do, which is why you're here explaining Bayern Munich to me. Manuel, thank you very much for taking the time to uh, to help me make sense of all things Bayern Munich. I very much appreciate it. No, thanks for having me on. and always love chatting about football in Germany. Lovely. All right. Well, he's been Manuel Faith. I've been Taylor Rockwell. Thank you very much for listening to Soccer 101. We'll be back with a new episode next week. 